Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. I've made a choice to rejoice and be glad in it. How about you? All right, both of you. All right, let's stand together this morning. Let's go into the presence of the Lord and worship the Lord, create an atmosphere that is conducive for his presence to minister to us today. Amen? Praise God. We're so thankful today for this opportunity that we can come into this house and give God praise and give him glory. Father, we thank you today for your presence. We thank you today for your anointing. We thank you for each and every one that has come to this house today to worship you and to bless your name. And we ask you today, God, as we lift up your name, that we create an atmosphere that is conducive for you to just flow and minister in this house. And God, that you will touch every heart and every life. And God, as we leave here today, let us know that we've had an encounter with the Holy Spirit, that God has empowered us, that has changed us, that has given us direction and purpose for our lives. And God, we give you praise and thanks for this today in the wonderful name of Jesus. And amen, amen, hallelujah. We're going to worship the Lord today. Miss Shannon is going to lead us in worship today. So let's worship together, all right? All right? That right there is interesting. All right. There we go. Let's worship Good together. Morning. Love is everlasting. It's an everlasting love. Your mercy is as new as every rising of the sun. And your loving kindness, loving kindness is better than life. Your grace is all sufficient, it's an all sufficient grace. Your power and your glory are forever on display. And your loving kindness, loving kindness is better than life. It's better, oh, 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 
you're glad he lives this morning come on just give him a praise if you're glad he lives today amen you might be seated today in the presence of the Lord it's good to have you today with us if this is your first time being with us we welcome you to the tabernacle we pray that you receive the prayer card on your way in today we believe in the power of prayer prayer changes not only us but it changes situations and so we are thankful for that today. and We believe in the power of prayer and we want to join with you in your need, amen, today. And so if you have a special need, please fill out one of those prayer cards so myself and the rest of the team here can join with you in prayer for your situation. How many know God answers prayer? Amen. Yes, amen. 
We've had prayers answered this week, God moving in a way that only God can and then divinely intervening on situations and we're so thankful and we're grateful for that today. Amen? Praise God. Amen. <clears throat> Let me just give you a couple of announcements that won't necessarily be on our uh, media announcements. We need workers for our vacation Bible school. These are not acting uh, parts. These are uh, parts to help with uh, crowd control and, and ministering to the children and that type of thing. And uh, we've already got all of the uh, actors and those kind of parts already taken care of. But we need your help to be able to uh, facilitate and do the work that needs to be done during Vacation Bible School. If you have not volunteered, we need you to do that today. There is a card out in the atrium that you can fill out before you leave this morning. Leave that there at the uh, Information Center. Let Pastor Eric know that he can count on you uh, to be a part of this. And it starts on the 22nd and goes through that week. And uh, we want to bless our children. Amen. Not only is it, this is uh, unlike many, as you know, the last few years, it's not uh, something that's just for children, but it is also for the whole family, and the whole family can be blessed and enjoy this time, and, and uh, we really want to call it a family crusade, but most of the people wouldn't know what that was, and so we continue to call it a vacation Bible school, but it really is a blessing to the whole family, amen? And uh, so come out and be a part of that get involved. Also, there's some flyers out there for you. Some have requested flyers to um, put on there. Let me encourage you to also use Facebook, use Twitter, right? Y'all asleep this morning. I believe we need to get up and do a little dance. <laughs> Wake up dance. Amen. There's some flyers out there for you to go and be a part. Be, take uh, advantage of Facebook and Twitter. Well, most of you are on there every day. There is uh, a link that you can go to Pastor Eric and also the church site and connect with that. You can also sign up your kids right on the, online at our church website and uh, so that it isn't hectic on the first night. Everybody is already signed up, so be sure to do that. And uh, it'll be a blessing. And so um, go ahead and take care of that. You know, they started a church in Louisville uh, a few years back. They spent $50,000 on the launch date uh, of advertisement, billboards, um, all kinds of different things to get the uh, people involved in that. On the first Sunday, they had over 2,000 people show up for their first service. They did a survey and ask how, how did you find out about our launch date? And over 80% of them, after they spent $50,000, 80, over 80% 80 of them said we found out by Facebook and Twitter. Amen. So they could have saved about $45,000 if they'd have just known that they were going to connect, right? And so it is a powerful tool. Be sure to use that. Get people involved. And uh, let's minister to our region, all right? Okay, let me tell you about these Wednesday night services. Generally on Wednesday night I'll preach, but uh, over the, this uh, month it's going to be different. Uh, we're going to be having a uh, Bible financial, biblical financial seminar. It's going to not just talk about money, but it's going to talk about every aspect uh, of your life and concerning finances, and we're going to do that on the 10th and the 17th. Um, John is going to be here with us, and he will be uh, talking to us about that. He is a financial consultant and knows uh, he is the first people that I ever heard of that they do they do due diligence to ensure that they invest in nothing that uh, helps support abortion, any kind of thing that is uh, that we stand against. They make sure that uh, whenever they make these investments, it doesn't go to those type type of things and God blesses them, amen? And so you're gonna be blessed by this, and so be sure to be here on the 10th and the 17th. 
The 24th, that week, is going to be vacation Bible school. And then on the 31st, um, Pastor Randall Black will be here with us uh, for one service only, and you'll be blessed by that ministry as well. Amen? Praise God. All right. We're going to uh, ask our ushers to come, and we're going to have uh, receive our morning tithe and offering today. And as they are doing that, you will receive our video announcements. And so you can look on the screen for those. And then I'm going to come back and give a couple of presentations this morning. Father, thank you today for your goodness and your grace. Thank you for your word and worship, God. We ask you today as we worship you and create an atmosphere that you will be lifted up and glorified. God, that everything that we do here today will exalt you and give you glory, honor, and praise. Now let your kingdom be established within your people today as we sow into the seed and time and harvest. We believe you, God, as we sow that we will receive. Even things that money cannot buy, you will bring back into our lives. And we give you praise and thanks for this now in Jesus' name. And amen. Amen. Let's see our announcements now. had a wonderful week. Thank you so much for spending part of your Sunday with us here at Tabernacle of Praise. We're thrilled that you're here. If this is your first time with us or you simply need some more info about our church, feel free to grab one of our ushers or greeters in the lobby and they'll be more than happy to help you. Again, we're so glad that you're here with us. It's going to be a great day. Well, summer is here and that means it's time for our annual family VBS. And this year's program is once again sure to be something that the entire family will want to experience together. So pack up your sleeping bag and sunscreen because we're heading off to camp. But not just any camp, we'll be camping on the shores of Lake Wanahakalugi. This year's Camp Adventure VBS will be a blast for the entire family. With crazy characters and games, prizes, music, and God's word presented in a fun way for the entire family to understand. Camp Adventure is coming up soon. It kicks off on Monday, July 22nd and wraps up on Friday, July 26th. You can pre-register your child by visiting our check-in station in Tab Kids or by visiting us online at hurricanechurch.com. There's still plenty of room for those who would like to serve that week as well. So if you'd like to help out for this fun-filled week, see Pastor Eric or one of our other Tab Kids staff members to get plugged in. Make plans now to be a part of this awesome and fun week for the entire family. You know, it's your faithful giving that allows us to continue to meet the needs of our community and world. We simply couldn't do it without your generosity. Recently, we added a safe and secure online giving option to make giving more convenient. You can simply go to our website, hurricanechurch.com, and click where it says online giving. There, you'll be directed to Easy Tithe, where you can easily give a one-time offering or set up recurring giving. The choice is yours. It's safe, secure, and simple to use, and your faithful giving will ensure that Tabernacle of Praise continues to make a difference in our community and world. Our Life Group's summer session has already begun, but it's never too late to join a Life Group and get connected. There's information about Life Groups in the lobby. Just see one of our greeters or ask for Pastor Kevin and they'll make sure you get the information you need. Life groups are an awesome way to grow in your walk with God and also to make connections and friendships within our church. If you're not yet in a life group, be sure to check them out today. There's always something going on here at the Tabernacle and one of the best ways you can keep up with what's going on is by checking out our mobile app on your smartphone. Go to the App Store on your iPhone or Android device and download the Church Link app. From there, search for Tabernacle of Praise and you'll have access to everything going on at the touch of a finger. You can watch or listen to past sermons, give online, post prayer requests, and more. It's a great way to stay connected to what's going on here at the Tab. So check it out today. going to uh, give uh, a couple of presentations today, one to um, Jimmy uh, and one to Kevin <coughs> for their accomplishment in certificate of ministry today. Uh, and we're going to um, 
present them with this certificate uh, through the Church of God. Uh, whenever you receive a minister certificate from the church of God uh, you know that you've done something you don't put ten dollars in the mail and they send it to you you are tested in every area of your life <clears throat> you are pushed to the point to try to make you quit it is true it's part of the assignment try to make you quit because if they can make you quit if they can break you during times of training you can't pastor you can't be involved in ministry. And so they push you to try to make you quit and see if you can endure this testing and, and the trials. And uh, they have accomplished that. Amen. And uh, so I'm going to ask them to come with their spouses today. And we're going to present them with their certificate of ministry this morning. Amen. Come on. today they have uh, met the requirements that the Bible teaches us in Timothy that we are to uh, be people of character we are people that honor and respect God and his church right and uh, they have been faithful in doing that and as a result of that it's my honor today to present them uh, Pastor, if you are not familiar with the church, there are three levels of ministry. There is the exhorters, there is the ordained minister, and then there is the ordained bishop. And uh, it is very uh, strategic in the way that those work out. And uh, you cannot do that over just a one-year period of time, that it'll take you uh, a long time to accomplish that. And uh, But these uh, people, these couples have committed themselves to learning, they have committed themselves to training, they have uh, discipled, uh, given themselves to discipleship, and as a result today, we are able to present them with uh, Kevin Dingus with ordained minister today, okay? Bless you. Bless you. Congratulations. James, we present you today with the exhorter certificate. Amen. You and Melinda. God bless you. Bless you. And Scarlett. All right. How many know ministry is more than just one person? But if you don't have both involved, it'll never work, right? And so all of our teams, all of the ministries here, that's the reason we look at whenever someone serves, if it's the husband or the wife, either one, we look at them as teams working together because if one isn't for it, the other one isn't going to get it done, right? And so I want you to just stand with me this morning. We're going to pray over these couples, and we're just going to ask God to continue to bless their ministry. Amen? Praise God. Father, I come to you today, and I thank you for Jimmy and Melinda and Scarlett, I thank you, God, for your hand being upon their life and your anointing that is uh, evident upon them today. God, I just speak blessing over them this morning, God, that they uh, raise up and be a prophet in their generation. God, that they be your voice, God, into their generation and minister through them, God, that the work of God and the kingdom of God will be established not only in their lives, but your very will will be accomplished through them. God, we just thank you for what you're doing in them. I thank you, God, for your hand that is upon their life. And Melinda, God, I know that today that you are moving and ministering in her life as well. And your hand is upon Scarlet. And we thank you and we praise you. And we stand uh, with great expectation of what you're doing and what you're going to do through the, this couple. And we give you praise and thanks for it today. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, we thank you for Kevin. We thank you for Brittany today, and we ask you, God, that you would continue to lay your hand upon them. God, that you will direct and ordain their steps. 
God, you, uh, it's evident that you have a, a specific plan. God, this couple will reach people in unusual ways. God, not, not just from a pulpit, but Lord, even in areas in ministry that God, sometimes we have neglected in the church, but you're raising them up for such a time as this. And we thank you for this. We thank you for your anointing that is upon their lives. And we ask you, God, that you would continue to move and to minister and help us, God, to impart truth, revelation, and knowledge and direction to them. God, that they will speak to their generation and cause them to hunger and desire for the things of God. And we give you praise and thanks for this today. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen, amen. God bless you guys. Amen. Praise God. Remain standing and let's worship the Lord. We're going to sing another song and then we'll come back for the word today. This is a prayer. Sing this prayer from your heart.
The Bible says we're the clay. And he's the potter and we're in his hands. And he molds us and he's forms us. And we just have to trust to put ourselves in his hands and to let him lead the way. He will lead you. He will guide you. You just have to pray, Lord, use me. I give myself to you, Lord. I give myself to you. Turn to your neighbor there, tell him, stay in his hands, stay in his hands. Amen. Praise God. Y'all are a lively bunch today. Amen. Your exuberancy is overwhelming me. Settle down, settle down. Praise God. Isn't God good? Amen. He is so good. He is it's more than just the story. He is the king of glory. And I'm glad I know who he is today for myself, don't you? I'm glad that he isn't just the God of my grandfather, God of my father, but he's my God. I know him as my savior. I know him as my healer. I know him as my Holy Spirit filler, baptizer. I know him as my peace. I know him as my joy. I know him as my answer. I know him as my provision. He is altogether lovely today. He is a wonderful counselor in times of need. He is peace in the middle of the storm. And he is our day spring in times of darkness. Amen. And so wherever you may be today, the good news is he's your God. And if he's your God, he can bring you out. Amen. Come on and give him some praise this morning. Appreciate Sister Shannon today. Didn't she do a wonderful job? We're so blessed with so many gifted and talented people here at the Tabernacle. And I just believe that you enjoy ministry, you enjoy the church, you enjoy the kingdom whenever you are fulfilling your purpose and your plan that God has ordained for you. Amen. And so if you're not connected, get connected, get involved in the kingdom. Amen. Because there is no greater joy than serving God where you're gifted and you're talented to do so. Amen. Praise God. We've been talking about this multi-generational blessing. Are you tired of hearing about it yet? Amen. Well, it's good because I'm going to talk about it again. Amen. This multi-generational blessing. I told you last week that I believe that this is perhaps the most important um, series that I have preached concerning end times. And I know that a lot of folks like to hear about the book of Revelation and all of that, and, and it's all good, it's all wonderful, 
but I believe that there, this is a strategic part to this end time move of God is whenever generations will come together and connect themselves together for the cause of Christ, amen, and see in the kingdom of God advanced. It isn't about you, it isn't about me, it's not about my likes, your likes, or our agenda. It's about advancing the kingdom of God, amen. And so when we do this, we see the power of God is released. There are some things, as we've talked, and I will not go over them again, only to say that if you miss them, you can find them on our website, all of them together. But it is uh, vitally important because there are some things God will not do until generations come together. And so we have to understand that. And we have been talking about this. We've talked about how Abraham had dug wells, how Isaac had come and redug the wells of his father. And then there came a time in his life when he dug his own wells. Uh, there it should be some places that we leave wells for a generation that is coming behind us. I want to leave a spiritual well that my children can drink from. Amen. I want to leave behind to another generation a place that they can go and they can experience the power and the presence of God. Where that they know that it isn't just something of yesterday, but it is a God of today. And if there ever was water there, there's still water there now. Amen. Amen. And so those wells, when they put those caps on those wells, there was a statue or a monument that would say to the passerby, there is water here. And we, if there's ever been a time that we desperately need some well diggers, it's in the hour in which we live. Because we have lost our way morally. We are living in a generation that is now biblically illiterate. They know nothing about God. They know nothing about Jesus. They know nothing about the word. And they need some spiritual wells in the midst of this uh, a spiritual famine so they can find their way back to Calvary and understand that there at Calvary is their hope. There is their peace. There is the answer for everything they need in their lives. Amen. And so we need some well diggers today. And when you look at the family tree of Abraham, you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob grew the family tree. He's the one that branched out. You need to understand that God blessed Jacob even though Jacob had issues. Amen. God changed his name from Jacob to Israel. Israel speaks of being, having favor by God. And when God changed Abraham's name, he, he changed his name from Abram to Abraham. When you look throughout the scripture, he always from that point on called him Abraham. But when you track the story of Jacob, God changes. He goes back and forth. He calls him Jacob then he calls him Israel, and then from there on out, sometimes God speaks of him being Israel, and other times he speaks of him being Jacob. And you see, uh, it's interesting to me because Jacob means to be trickster or a surplanter. Israel means to have favor with God. And when you referred to, when he referred to them, he refer, always referred to them as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Why wouldn't he, after changing his name, call him Abraham, Isaac, and Israel? I believe that he did that because he knew that we might be in a mess ourselves, and he wanted us to know that you can be a mess and still be blessed. Amen. Because you see, he has redeemed us and he has called us by our name. And there have been days when we look more like Jacob than we do Israel. Come on, somebody. Oh, I know you're saved, but you ain't always looking like you're favored. I know you're calling on the name of Jesus, but you ain't always looking blessed. You can come up in the church looking all nice and cute, but the reality is every Monday morning the bluebirds are not singing at your door. Come on. I ain't got no real people up in here today, so I just preach to myself. 
Amen. Because the reality is there are days whenever it looks like we're more like the trickster than we are the one favored by God. Amen. But I want to tell you that the good news is that it doesn't matter if you're feeling like you're Israel or feeling like Jacob, that every single day God is faithful and you are a child of the Most High God. Amen. You have the favor of the Lord upon your life. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter if, it, if, if, if glory is uh, just coming down or you're going through a testing and a trial. You are still the favored of the Lord. Amen. Abraham had one son. Isaac had two sons. And Jacob, he just blew it up. He had 12. During the famine, Jacob goes to Egypt. Now, we see that Isaac stayed where his father dwelt, right? I said Isaac stayed where Abraham had been. He had conquered the land, he had dug the wells, and Isaac stayed and dwelled in that land. Jacob went into Egypt, Egypt representing the world. But even in a worldly system, God still blessed Jacob. And Jacob started out with 12 uh, on his side and he when they returned the Bible declares that there was more than 1.5 million of them that came out of Egypt and when they came out they came out with the gold and the silver amen they didn't come out broke busted and disgusted they didn't come out just holding the fort till it comes come on somebody but when they came out they went in 12 of them and came out 1.5 million of them and they had the gold and the silver of the world i don't know i read it somewhere where he said the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just and i believe that god is wanting us to understand he don't just want us to do a thing amen how many know if you're going to build the kingdom of God it's going to take some money go out here to the 84 lumber or Lowe's and tell them we're going to build on to the church so we just back up our truck and they're going to say that's good that's going to be fifteen hundred thousand dollars amen because it's going to cost you some money baby amen you don't go down there and you pull the, the church van into the gas station. They don't say, oh, you're highly favored and blessed. Go on your way. No, they say, give me some money. Amen. Because it takes money to do ministry. And now when Jacob comes out of Egypt, he doesn't come out broke. He don't come out holding the fort. He comes out with the gold and the silver of a world system and says we're going to build the kingdom of God right here, praise God. And so today we need to understand that we may be in a world system, but we don't have to be of the world. And whenever we will use godly principles and we will stay in that covenant with God, that even in a world system, God can bless bless you right where you are amen Psalms 105 and verse 37 said he brought them forth with also with the silver and the gold and there was not one feeble person among them hallelujah that ought to get you happy amen because what good does it do to have the gold and the silver if you can't enjoy it? What good does it do to have a hundred dollar steak if you don't have no teeth in your head? Come on. What good does it do for you to have a house and a, and a ten thousand dollar bed if you can't sleep at night? You see, it does you no good. And so God said, not only am I going to give you the gold and the silver, but I'm going to keep you healthy so you can enjoy the blessing and the favor. Amen. I believe in divine healing, but I also heard him say to walk in divine health. Healing comes when you've already been sick, but divine health keeps you from getting sick. Come on, somebody. Amen. And that's what happened. There was 12 of them went in, but 1.5 million came out. And when they came out, it didn't say all of those below 40 didn't have no sickness. It didn't say all of them below 50 got away and was feeling good. He said there wasn't one sick one among them. Every one of them 
were highly favored. Every one of them were walking in the divine health of God. Hallelujah. Why? Because of the father Abraham. Because of the covenant that God made with Abraham, now this a generation's past will understand that not only am I the God that finances a thing, but I'm the God that will cause you to walk in divine health every day of your life. Hallelujah. If God is able to do that for them under the covenant of animals' blood, how much more should you and I be blessed today with it sealed with the blood of Jesus Christ? Amen. You see, we, we are under a better covenant today. God is a long-term planner. When God makes a covenant, he don't have just one generation in mind. Amen. In fact, he says that whenever I spoke this, I told you a couple of times, but I'll tell you again today. He made one covenant, and that covenant was with Abraham. And other times when he comes back and makes the covenant, it's a reconnection to the covenant that was broken. But through scripture, he makes covenant. In Psalms 105, he said he remembers his covenant forever. How long? Forever, the word which he commanded for a thousand generations. The covenant which he made with Abraham and an oath to Isaac, he confirmed it to Jacob from a statue to Israel as an everlasting covenant. As an everlasting covenant saying to you, I will give you the land of Canaan as a, a allotment of your inheritance. Glory to God. He's telling, re, reminding them, saying, hey, look, I didn't just give you this to your grandfather. I didn't just give it to your father. But he said this covenant is an everlasting covenant. We talked Wednesday night and we put the pieces together that the covenant that Abraham received is the same covenant that you and I are living in today. It's not something that was made up in the law. It was before the law. And God has brought it to us today. And we have a part of the covenant. We have a part of the promise. What is the part of our promise in this covenant? In the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and handmaidens, I will pour out of my spirit. And they will prophesy in those days. You see, we are still got a connection to the Abrahamic covenant and our part of that promise is in the last day get ready I'm going to pour my spirit out on all flesh glory to God he didn't say he was going to pour it out on the church. He didn't say he was going to pour it out on the holy. He didn't say he was going to pour it out on a certain people group. He said all flesh is going to experience my power. And then it's going to be up to you what to do with it. Amen. I'm telling you today that we're living in the greatest hour of the kingdom. When God is going to pour out his spirit in this last day. And people want to tell you gloom and doom and despair. Let me tell you as your pastor today if all you listen to is gloom and doom then that's what you're going to believe you need to shut that tv off you need to tell that devil to shut up because even though this world is in darkness the bible says we're living in a dual society there is the kingdom of this world but there's also the kingdom of god and while darkness is abounding he said grace does much more abound he said that there will be a growing away and a waxing cold but he also said at the same same time I'm going to pour my spirit out on a people that are hungry a people that are thirsty and I'll show my glory in the midst of it all oh come on and praise him this morning we have an everlasting covenant David had an understanding that he was walking in the covenant of Abraham and he knew how much power was in a covenant blessing. David was a man who had issues. He had an affair with a married woman. His own son led a rebellion against him. There was incest in the family. There were family feuds that were going on. 
But in spite of it all, David also knew that God keeps his promises. Psalms 89 and verse 34. He said, my covenant I will not break. This is God say, speaking. My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that I, has gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne was the, the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon, even like the, a faithful witness in the sky. Amen. Psalms 105 and verse 8. He remembers his covenant forever. The word that I commanded, he said, it's for a thousand generations. The covenant which I made to Abraham, he said, I made it to oath to Isaac and I'm confirming it in Jacob. In other words, I'm bringing it to pass in Jacob. I told you in the beginning that, that God gave the promise to Abraham, but whenever Isaac was born, he did not see the promise even then. It wasn't until uh, we see Jacob was birthed that the beginning of the promise that God had made to Abraham began, began to be fulfilled. And we get upset if we don't get an answer in a month. Huh? Huh? We give up if God don't do what we want him to do in a year. And Abraham had this promise, but it took three generations for that promise to even begin to be fulfilled. 1 Kings chapter 15 it said, In the eighth year, King Jehoram, uh, the son of Nebat, became king over Judah. And he walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him. His heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, and was the heart of his father, as his, the heart of his father David. Nevertheless, for David's sake, does that give us a license to go and sin? No. But God said, even though. He's not even walking in the covenant for David's sake. The Lord, his God, gave him a lamp in Jerusalem. By setting up his son after him and by establishing Jerusalem because David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and had not turned aside from anything he commanded him all the days of his life except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. I've heard people make this. They say, you know, the Bible says that God doesn't answer prayer except out of covenant. And I've heard people say, well, I'm not a Christian, but I asked God to do something, and he answered me. No, he didn't. No, because God does not answer prayer except in covenant. Well, how do you get saved? Well, it's easy. God is answering the prayer of somebody who has prayed for you. And because he is answering the prayer of a believer that has called your name out, let the Spirit say come and let the bride say come. You've got to both be in agreement, right? And so the spirit and the bride, the spirit's beckoning, but there has to be somebody interceding on your behalf. That's the reason why we're not seeing folks saved today. Huh? The church has got complacent. We don't pray for the lost anymore. We don't seek God for those who are lost. We, we just let them go to hell. Come on. But you see, he said, let the spirit say come and let the bride say come. He says he, he answers prayer out of covenant. And so whenever I intercede for that one that is lost, when you intercede for that one that is lost, God answers their prayer out of a response to you praying and interceding for them. Amen. And so we call, all of us come into the kingdom of God in such a way. Amen. And so here we look and we see that he say, people say, well, you know, I, I'm not a Christian, but I asked God and he answered my prayer. No, he, he's, there's a lot of things in our life we didn't get because we is all that and a bag of chips and some government cheese. Amen. 
we got that because of faithful people that had gone before us and walked in a covenant and out of that covenant, out of obedience, God is blessing you not because of you but in spite of you. It's quiet up in here. Amen. God blesses sometimes the blessings that you receive are not always about what you have done. It's about what others have done before you and God is honoring his word over you. Amen. Now I'm going to say it again. That doesn't give us a license to sin. It doesn't give us a, a place to say, well, we don't have to do anything because, no, because we're not living to ourselves. We've got to do the same thing for another generation yet to come. Why did God do this? Because of David. Now watch this, 2 Kings chapter 8 and verse 18. That was 86 years after David's death that he answered and did this. But now in 2 Kings chapter 8 and verse 18, it's 156 years after David is dead. And he walked in the way of king of Israel just as the house of Ahab had done. For the daughter of Ahab was his wife. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, yet the Lord would not destroy Judah. Why? For the sake of his servant David. As he had promised him, he gave a lamp to him and his sons forever. 156 years later, and God is still remembering the covenant. He's saying, I'm not going to destroy Judah. I'm Jehoram, I'm not going to destroy this place because I have promised my servant David. Not just in his generation, but I would give a lamp to him and his sons forever. 2 Kings chapter 20 and verse 6. 300 years later, Hezekiah is getting ready to die. Remember this? And Hezekiah, he told him, told the servant, he said, go tell Hezekiah, get his house in order because he's going to die and not live, right? And then he, and it says here, he returned and tell Hezekiah, the Lord, the leader of my people, thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father. I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears and surely I will heal you. On the third day, you shall go up to the house of the Lord, and I will add to your years, days, 15 years. I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Syria, and I will defend this city for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. Now you've got to get this because I've preached on this, this text a lot of times over the past years. Amen. I've preached it but I've never seen this. Because, you know, whenever I was a young preacher boy and didn't, and didn't know anything, I preached that God repented and forgave, you know, he, he changed his mind for Hezekiah. Right? And told him, well, you know, huh, couldn't you take a joke? I'm going to give you 15 more years. That wasn't quite the way I preached it, but I said, God changed his mind. Well, God didn't change his mind. And then I began to look at it, and I said, well, he repented, so God uh, answered his prayer because he repented, and that's probably partially so, but it's not altogether so. What I found out when I'm looking at this scripture over the last couple of months is that God didn't answer Hezekiah for Hezekiah's sake. 300 years later... He can't stop talking about a man by the name of David because David was in covenant with him. And he tells Hezekiah, Hezekiah, I'm going to restore 15 years to you. I've seen your tears. I've seen you repent, but it's not about that. What it is about is I made a covenant with your, your grandfather, your father, David, right? 
in, uh, in, 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 whenever you look at scriptures, it doesn't mean that when he calls him a father, it doesn't mean that he's the next generation descendant. It means he's a descendant of that lineage, right? And so he's saying, I'm going to make a covenant with your father, David. And he said, because of that, I'm going to add 15 years to you. And I am going to protect this city. Hallelujah. I believe today that we need to understand that we're not just living for God on our own or for ourselves, but we are living for another generation that is yet to come. Amen. 300 years later, and God honors his word to David and says, I'm going to protect this city. I'm going to take care of you, and I'm going to add 15. You're not deserving, Hezekiah. You're not getting this because you're deserving. You're getting this because you're in covenant. Amen. Aren't you glad you don't get what you deserve? I'm glad I don't get what I deserve. I'm glad that I'm in covenant relationship today. Amen. I'm in a relationship today because of God, what God has done, the mercies of Jesus Christ, that he has brought a covenant to me that I can have life and have it more abundantly. In Genesis 9 and verse 9, God says, and as for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. He's not just making covenant with one generation, but your descendants, Abraham. Acts 2 and 39, for this promise is to you and your children and all who are afar off even as many as the Lord our God will call. Amen. It's not just to you, but it's to the generations that are coming after you. Amen. And so we need to begin, you know, we got this mindset, well, what I do doesn't matter. It's none of your business. Yes, it is my business. Because you're messing with my covenant. Amen. Well, you say, well, it don't matter. Yes, it does matter. Because whenever God looks upon a people, he doesn't look at them individually. He looks at them corporately. Achan. Huh? Everyone else being obedient in all of Israel. And one stupid man goes out and thinks he can steal God's tithe. And the whole country, the whole nation, the whole group of people have to suffer because of one stupid person. I don't know how long it'll take me, Brother Jimmy, but someday I'm going to ask God about that. I don't think that's quite right, do you? God looks at us corporately. He don't look at us individually. Yeah, our salvation is individual, but our covenant is corporate. And he looks at us and he says, I'm going to bless you not because of what you have done. I'm going to bless you because of the covenant that I made. Not just with you, but with your father and your father's father. Amen. We are talking about a multi-generational blessing. You may have children are acting crazy right now, but you need to get a hold of these verses and declare that not only will you be blessed, but your children will be blessed. Amen. You need to declare today that I am in the covenant of Abraham. Amen. That royal blood is flowing through my veins. That I am a partaker of his divine nature. I am a chosen one, a called out one, a predestined one. I am of the righteousness of God. Amen. And there is no division or defeat in my life. I always win and I never lose. And begin to declare that not only over your life, but over your family and over your children and your children's children. And let the world boldly declare to the world that we are blessed, not because of what we have done, but because of a covenant that God has made to his people. We've got to leave something behind. 
If you, if you, if, if you die when, when they put you in a grave, you've wasted your life, man. If, if you don't outlive your body, you've wasted your assignment on the earth. With God's help and His grace, my fingerprints will be all over this next generation. They may, if God tarries, they put, will put me in a ground somewhere and they'll say ashes to ashes and dust to dust. But with God's help, I won't be dead. Amen. But I, my fingerprints will be on another generation. Amen. The anointing that God has placed upon my life will outlive me because I fully intend on laying my hands upon another generation and imparting this anointing into their life and tell them, run on, run on, run on with the kingdom of God. Amen. Get this. You have to impart before you depart. I said, you've got to impart before you depart. Abraham blessed his sons before he departed. Isaac thought of his sons before he left. Jacob thought of his sons before he died. Moses laid hands upon Joshua. Right? The Bible says, we talked about it on a Wednesday night, but the Bible says that Joshua received wisdom because Moses had laid his hands upon him. Joshua wasn't that, all of that. He wasn't so anointed that he got, was able to do what Moses could not do. He left those people out of bondage because a senior Moses that knew that he was fading and another generation was living, he had enough wisdom about him that he laid his hands upon a Joshua and said, I'm not going to get it done, son, but I'm going to put this anointing on you for wisdom and I'm going to cause you to rise up and take this people out of a land of bondage that I wasn't able to. That's what in impartation will do. It'll cause you in a moment, amen, to be able to learn something that took another generation their whole life to live. Amen. That's the reason, that's how powerful it is for you to have a mentor. Because a mentor can teach you in five days what it took them 50 years to learn. And if you'll just listen to them, it can save you a whole lot of heartache. Amen. You see, he laid his hands upon Joshua and the spirit of anointing of wisdom came upon him. I said that's the reason, that, you know, it, it, it has also validated what I've always believed. That there is a spirit of stupid that gets on people. Amen. Amen. Because you can have people live up under sound doctrine and sound teaching and a little bit of trouble come and stupid get all over them. Amen. Act like they don't have no word. Act like they don't have no direction, no wisdom. But I want to tell you that you can get up under sound doctrine and there can be an impartation into your life. Amen. Where the anointing and the spirit of God will flow upon you. And when hard times come, you don't go crazy. You stand in the word of God and say, with God I live and with God I die. And I'm going to have victory right here today in my life. Elijah imparted to Elisha. I know people say, well, who do they think they are? Impartation. Huh. Well, just read the book, baby. Amen. Elijah imparted his anointing upon Elisha until when he walked back past the school of the prophets, they said, here comes Elisha, but it looks like Elijah. He said that same anointing, that same spirit is resting on Elijah. But where is Elijah? Paul laid hands upon a young Timothy. You may say, well, pastor, I don't have any sons or I don't have any children. Well, do what Paul did. Adopt a spiritual son. Adopt a spiritual daughter. Impart into their lives. Amen. 
Paul laid his hands upon Timothy so that whenever he would go and lay his body in the ground that his assignment was not over but it lived through Timothy. Jesus imparted to his disciples and they all understood the power of transfer from generation to generation. They understood if we're going to get this job done We've got to impart it to another generation. We have done run our race. We have done our part. And now it's time for us to hand this off to another generation. And before we die, we're going to lay our hands upon them and believe God what we could not get accomplished. This generation will see it with their very eyes. Amen. Amen. Joshua never named a successor. Joshua never laid hands upon his successor. He never named his successor. And two generations later, Israel is in apostasy. Two generations. And they're in apostasy. Elisha went to the grave, never transferring the anointing. Amen? Gehazi didn't want it. But Elisha should have said, okay, Gehazi, if you don't want it, I'm going to impart it to somebody. But that didn't happen. And as a result, God had to do a supernatural thing. He said, if this generation don't have enough sense to receive an impartation, I'm going to get me a dead man. How I many know God can only use dead people? It's not us that lives, but it's Christ that lives in us. And he said, I've got to get this impartation to another generation one way or another. And now Elijah, Elisha is dead, and they don't have enough sense to know that an impartation has got to be transferred to this generation. And so he takes a dead man and allows him to be thrown in to where Elijah's bones were. And whenever it touched his bones... You realize when scripture, whenever it talks about bones, it's talking about promises. It says that your promises can't be broken. That's the reason why when in Psalms, when they talked about Jesus, they said none of his bones will be broken. None of his promises will be broken. Whenever they would go and they would defeat their enemy in Bible times, they would take their the priests that had sacrificed to a false gods and they would take and they would burn them and they would scatter their bones out. It was saying that your God has no power. He doesn't have any authority to be able to bring the promise about but whenever Jesus even hung upon that cross there was no bones broken because he has the power to bring the promise to pass he has the word but he also has the power and the word and the promise that he has given you it does not matter if it did not come to pass with you it is not a promise broken it is a promise that remains and God will watch over his word and hasten to perform it. <laughs> Hebrews talks about a rest that God had given. And he says there remaineth yet a rest for the people of God. Why does the rest remain? Because the previous generation did not have the spiritual perception to wrap their arms of faith around it and believe God that there is a place of rest. And so God promised it to this generation, but they never received it. So he didn't take it back because one generation couldn't wrap their arms of faith around it. He left it for another generation and said, if you will dare to believe it, if you can wrap your arms of faith around it, around it there is a rest for the people of God that you can go into I want to tell you today that God has not changed his mind his word is still true his promises are still available for you and I and everything that he has promised he will bring to pass we've just got to rise up quit playing church and say God I believe every promise in your book I believe the covenant you made with Abraham and I'm going to wrap my arms of faith around it and say kingdom of God come and will of God be done now in my life oh come on and praise him right here today yeah. 
Whatever you do, make sure your life outlives you. I said make sure your life outlives you. Make sure you make a deposit in the next generation. You might be saying, well, Pastor, I don't, I, I don't have a godly heritage. I don't have a Christian heritage. My, my, my parents are heathens. My grandfather's a steel man, moonshine. I don't have any hope. Yeah, you do. Because this man by the name of Abraham, he wasn't always a servant of God. He was a star worshiper. Father of faith. Huh? Was a star worshiper. In fact, they had 79 different gods that they worshiped. And Abraham was called from the place of Ur. You are Ur. We talked about it in this series. He drilled wells, and in those places of wells, there was tension and hostile, right? There's places of confusion. And God had to call him out of the land of confusion and hostility so he could bless him. Hallelujah. Had to call him out of that place of confusion. That place, Ur, is now known today as modern Iraq. How many know they're still confused? Amen. There's still confusion there. They were worshiping 79 different gods. And God called Abraham out of that place of confusion to start something new. Amen. Abraham, I know that your forefathers were serving idol gods. I know they were star worshipers, but I want you to be a pioneer. I want you to be a trailblazer. I want you to be somebody that does something different from here on out. And you're not going to you're not going to add me and be number 80, but I am going to be the only God that you'll ever serve the rest of your days. And I'm going to be faithful to you and reveal myself to you in such a way that you will know that you don't need any other God. Hallelujah. I praise God, but he had to bring him out of that place of confusion. He had to leave the place of demonic drama. Had to shut the door on the drama so he can begin to serve a God that don't have drama. Amen. You may not have a heritage today, but you can do something new right now. You can purpose in your heart from this generation forth that there'll be no more drama, there'll be no more confusion, but we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to be like Jeremiah, and we're, for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord from here on out. Amen. We're going to bless the Lord at all times. You see, your name, your uh, home might be full of demonic drama. You might have lived in a life that is chaotic and confusion and fighting and, and throwing plates is normal. But I want to tell you today that that isn't the will of God. It isn't the plan of God. He has a plan for your life where that it's not full of chaos. It's not full of drama. I hate drama. I refuse to live a life in drama. I'll not let drama live in my house. Amen. I'm telling you today, you need to, if you've got drama in your life, you need to draw yourself a circle around yourself and say this is a drama-free zone, baby. Amen. There ain't no drama going to come up in here. There's not going to be no drama in my family, in my marriage. There's not going to be any drama in my children. There's not going to be any drama in the church. Amen. We're going to draw a circle around ourselves and say we are leaving the place of drama and we're going to serve the God of our father Abraham and he didn't have drama he had a covenant and we're going to live in that covenant and know our God be strong and do exploit in this last day we need to start a start a campaign just say no to drama amen 
Some people like it. I hate it. Is that strong enough for you to understand what I'm saying? I don't just despise it. I hate it. Amen. Because drama is not of God. Confusion is not of God. And God had to bring Abraham out of that drama and confusion so he could bless him. And say from this point on, I'm going to bless your family. I'm going to bless generations to come after you. In fact, Abraham, the blessing that I'm going to give you is never going to end. It's an everlasting covenant. We, like Abraham, are in the business of building altars and drilling wells for the next generation. I said, that's our job. That's our responsibility. Build altars and drill wells and we'll be successful. Amen. Build altars. Teach your children how to pray. Teach them how to make sacrifice. Amen. Let me tell you, we're one generation away from losing this thing. And it's time for the church to stand up and take it back. Amen. I'm not against sports. I'm not against extracurricular activity. I love it all. But let me tell you, when we have raised up now three generations and told them that sports are more important than Wednesday night, when we have told them that they can go all over the country, you can go all over the country and play sports and miss out on Sunday and just put God on the back burner, the devil is a liar. And let me tell you, there's a bloom payment that's coming due to this generation and we have taught them we have taught them that just live your life, make yourself fulfilled, enjoy your life, and just put God in whenever you can. But God wouldn't be number 80 for Abraham, and he's not going to be number 80 for you and me. If we're going to get the blessing, we've got to seek him first, put him first in our life, and then all of these other things will be added to us. We got to put him first. That don't mean we tell him you need to go to church. That means we bring him. Amen. Now, I know folks work and I know all that kind of stuff, but church needs to be priority number one in your life. Amen. I said, well, I don't know about all of that. It's God first, family second, church third. And if you get those out of priority, you're going to get all jacked up. Amen. Family time, ain't you watching gun smoke and misses down at the store and the kids playing games in another room? Huh? We've taught this thing family time. Where else better to spend time with your family than the house of God? got quiet up in here today I thought you was quiet earlier I ain't beating you down I'm telling you folks if we don't get it right another generation is going to suffer the consequences we've got to put God first so that another generation knows the kingdom of God is important to our lives what we do everything resolves around the kingdom of God we've got to make sacrifices amen Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Build altars and put God first. Teach them how to pray. Amen. Teach them how to pray till they pray through. I know I'm going old school on you, but you need it. Amen. Pray till you pray through. Don't just pray, oh, God, would you please do this for me? And then you run up and, you know, have time, whatever. But it's about an earnest, passionate prayer that touches the heart of God. That when we do it, we say we believe God for a thing. Amen? And I don't want to preach a whole different message today, but we've put more, we've put more emphasis on modern medicine 
We put more emphasis on jobs. We put more emphasis on the things of a world system than we have the kingdom of God. But I promise you this, my brother and sister, if you will put him first in your life, I said if you will put him first in your life, he will add all of these other things unto you. Amen. Teach your children how to pray. Teach them how to seek the face of God. If you teach them how to pray, the famines that they will d d deal with after you're dead and gone, the things that they have to endure when they can't pick up the phone and say, Mom or Dad, how do I get through this? You can instill that into their life that when they come into their own famines, they will know how to get a hold of the heart of God and get wisdom and direction for themselves, praise God. We need desperately to be able to raise up a generation that knows how to call on God and get answers to prayer and if we're not careful we'll miss building these halters and people will that come after us will not know how to get a hold of God Amen. teach them how to pray so in the midst of their famine when they can lose everything everything gone Take the house, take the car, take the food. But if you taught them how to pray, the same God that gave them it to them the first time will restore it to them now because they know how to pray. Dig wells. Dig a well that your children and your grandchildren can draw spiritual water from. Because they will have to endure famines. It's not if, but when. They will have to deal with famines in their life. Whenever you see people, many times in places of need, they come to the well. It refers to Jacob's well. It refers to a well that when they lose their way, that they can go by the well and they can draw water from the wells of salvation. Amen. Drill a well where wi wisdom will spring forth in times of drought. Drill a well where healing will come forth whenever physicians say we've done all that we know how to do. Amen. Teach your children to believe in God is a healer. Amen. A well of deliverance. Praise God, you see, there was a woman that came by the well one day and Jesus said, I've got to go past there. Why? Because he had a divine appointment by God at the well. And there was a woman there that had five husbands, right? And the scripture said that day that Jesus came by the well. Amen. And there is a whole lot of different scenarios and different ways of looking at this. But one thing is for sure. There is a well of deliverance that is in Jesus Christ. Amen. Whenever you come to him. Amen. The things that used to bind you. The, the, the mindset you used to have will be broken off of your life. And that's what happened that day. She took a drink from that fountain and she never thirst again. I want to tell you today that before you go off of this planet before you lay, lay you down you need to drill some wells and build some altars that the generation coming behind you in the time of their famine will know that there is power in the name of Jesus that we serve an awesome God amen I'm, I'm so thankful and I'm grateful today to be your pastor but before I'm your pastor I've got to pastor my family and I refuse to raise up a church or even a family that doesn't know the power of God. I'm going to raise up my children that when you're sick you can lay hands on yourself and say in the name of Jesus be healed. Amen. I'm going to raise up my son and my daughter to know there is a well called the baptism of the Holy Spirit that when everything else in your life fails you can go to that well and it'll give you direction. It'll give you power. It'll give you authority over all of the works of the enemy when you feel like you're weary and you can't go on just get to the well and at that well you will find strength you will find hope and you will find power to overcome oh I wish somebody believed it today just stand to your feet and give him some kind of praise this morning 
Come on, let's give him praise in here today because he is a multi-generational God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, we bless you and we praise you today. We bless you and we praise you today. How many know he's an awesome God? I said, how many know he really is awesome? He's been awesome in your life. Hallelujah. You ever been down and he came your way? If God hasn't never done nothing for you, if he didn't come and bless you in ways you didn't need to be blessed, if he, he hasn't never answered a prayer or solved a problem or given you direction for your life, then I give you permission to sit down and keep your mouth shut. But if he has done a thing for you in your life, you need to praise him and give him glory for what he has done because without him we would all be miserable. If it had not been for the Lord on our side, our enemy would have already destroyed us. Amen. But thank God for Calvary. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God there is a well we can draw from here this morning. And he is an awesome God. I've asked Shannon today to sing about his awesomeness. I don't know, you, do you have the words, Shannon, for it up here or not? If you don't have the words, I want you to think about it because he's an awesome God today. And I want you to worship him like he's some kind of awesome. Come on, we're getting ready to leave here in a moment, but let's worship him for who he is.
Hallelujah. I want you to take your neighbor by the hand to the left, to the right of you. I want you to cross the aisles today. I want us to connect today. It's just an assignment of unity and oneness of heart. There's people here today that are going through trials and difficulties, situations that are perhaps for some are even unmentionable. I know they have a smile up on their face, but they're broken in their spirit. God can touch them right here today. How many believe that with me? Amen. I want to ask God today to be just that. Whatever you need, he is I am to you today. Amen. So let's believe for that one on our right and the one on our left and just ask God to touch them and be whatever they need today for him to be. Will you do that? Father, in the name of Jesus, I just believe you this morning. I believe you, God, that you're touching my brother and my sister on my right and on my left. God, that you're moving in their lives today. You're ministering to them by your Holy Spirit. Let the kingdom of God be involved in their lives today. Let your Holy Spirit breathe upon them and minister to them by your Holy Spirit. He's awesome. Oh, he's awesome. Yes, he's awesome. awesome to you today. Will you give him praise? Hallelujah. He's the lover of our souls. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Don't forget today as you be leaving um, to help out with our VBS. Be sure to sign those cards on your way out. And let's have an awesome time. Amen. Pouring into another generation. Amen. 
Praise God. So just uh, do that on your way out today. Let's um, let Pastor Eric and the ministry team back there know that we aren't just leaving them by their own, but this generation is going to touch them. Amen? And help to minister to them. So let's do that together. Together, it'll be better than ever, right? Amen. Let me bless you today. Father, I bless your people in the name of Jesus in their uprising, their downsetting, and their coming in and their going out. I pray that everything that their hands touch this week calls it to prosper and be blessed in Jesus' name. And amen. Amen. God bless you as you go today.